Hello and welcome to the second lecture of Econ 2301, Principles of Macroeconomics. This lecture will cover Chapter 3, Exchanges and Markets. Before we begin, let's revisit the principle of opportunity cost. If you will remember, the opportunity cost of something is what you sacrifice or give up to get it. The opportunity cost of Johnny Manziel signing autographs, whether he did it for money or not, ended up being half a game's play versus rice. This opportunity cost is very small, and if he had to make the decision all over again, he probably would do it in a heartbeat. Whereas, if the opportunity cost had been a full year suspension, he may think twice. Opportunity cost tells us a lot about how people and nations should specialize and what they should trade for. Comparative advantage is the ability of one person or nation to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost than the other nation or person. Absolute advantage, which you are probably more familiar with, is the ability of one person or nation to produce a product at a lower resource cost than the other person or nation. If you will look at Table 3.1, which you can also find in your book, you will see two people and their, their various abilities to collect coconuts or catch fish. They could specialize in either or. If we look first at the amount of coconuts that they can each collect, we see that Fred could collect two coconuts while Kate can collect one coconut. We know that two is greater than one, therefore Fred has an absolute advantage over Kate when it comes to specializing in coconuts. Meanwhile, when fishing, Fred also has an absolute advantage because he can fish or catch fish at a rate of six per day, while Kate can only catch one fish per day. Therefore, Fred has the absolute advantage in both coconuts and fish. But Fred can't do both. He needs to specialize. And if we only look at this, we would say that Kate can get one or the other, therefore we don't know what particular task they should specialize in. When we look at opportunity cost, though, we are able to see how they should specialize and what they should trade for. If Fred were to collect coconuts, he would have an opportunity cost of three fish. Meanwhile, Kate, when she collects coconuts, has an opportunity cost of one fish. Three is greater than one, therefore, whichever has the lower opportunity cost has a comparative advantage, that is Kate, should specialize in coconuts. When fishing, Fred has an opportunity cost of one-third coconut, and Kate has an opportunity cost of one coconut. One-third is less than one, Therefore, Fred has a comparative advantage. When looking at this, we can see that Fred, if he were to specialize in fishing, he could fish every day, meet his needs, and trade for, with the excess, coconuts from Kate. Oops. So what are the lessons of comparative advantage and specialization, and how do they apply? Well, first we need to define what import and export is. Import, which you are probably pretty familiar with these two terms. Import is a product produced in a foreign country or a country not your own and purchased by the residents of the home country. Meanwhile, an export is a product produced in a home country or your own country and sold in another country. In other words, if you look at a particular item and it says made in China, that is an import. If the item was in China and it said made in the US, it would be export of the United States. You can read through these three things and how they benefit us and the different ways outshoring and outsourcing is affecting us and insourcing jobs. Let me just say this. Oftentimes, people will say we're losing jobs to the Chinese and how bad it is. Well, 
if you were to look at the opportunity cost, we would see that some of these jobs are not that ideal and we're actually replacing them with more expensive, better paying jobs. You know, we could make the iPad here in the United States, but the iPad would probably cost $10,000 to make. Meanwhile, in China, it doesn't cost that much and we can afford to buy the iPad. If we sell back the iPads after they make, we, they make them and they ship them to us, we have more money, they actually have the money from building them, everybody's better off. I will talk more about the principle of voluntary exchange, which means that everybody is better off when a trade is made, but for now, I just want to point out that not all jobs that are lost to the Chinese or any other country are necessarily bad. In fact, if we were losing a good job, we would be willing to take a pay cut and do that particular job. The, the division of labor and exchange. Adam Smith, which is a very important person, he is the father of modern economics. That will be on the exam. He is the father of modern economics. In his book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, or Wealth of Nations for short, Adam Smith noted three things that happen or benefit us with the division of labor. The first is repetition. Repetition is the more times that you do a particular task, the better you become at it. Think of it this way. If you were working at a fast food restaurant and it was your first day behind the counter and you were taking orders, you would probably be very slow. However, if you had been there three months, you would probably be very good. Any time that you go to a place and there's a cashier in training, you know that it's going to take a little longer to check out. It's because they haven't benefited from repetition yet. Second, continuity. A specialized worker doesn't spend time going from one task to the other. You see this most commonly in assembly lines. Henry Ford is famous for designing the assembly line and making it so that one person would focus on one task and another person would focus on a completely different task and by the end of all the tasks a car was put together. This made it much faster for them to produce cars at a much faster rate which in turn lowered the cost and lowered the prices of cars. The more people that were able to buy of cars, the higher the demand you get to today in which everybody has at least one. In fact, most families have an average of two 2.5 cars. Third is innovation. Innovation is ability to see particular insights by doing the task over and over again and specializing in that task. You're able to see a great way of doing it. Think of it this way. How many of you have been taught by your boss how to do something in which they never really did and their way just didn't work for you? Well, innovation, by doing it over and over again, provides you the ability to do it faster, better, more efficient. Let's move on to markets. The first two markets we're going to cover are market economy and central centrally planned economies. The United States is more of a market economy, but we have some, um, some similarities to centrally planned economies. However, I wouldn't say that we are more centrally planned. I would still say that we're more of a free market economy. A market economy is an economy in which people specialize and exchange goods and services in the markets. It's very free-flowing. I have the ability to work at a place and quit that place. Various people have the ability to produce goods, sell goods to me. A market economy is one in which I trade my money for goods and services and people produce goods and services for money. Meanwhile, a centrally planned economy is one in which the government decides how much of a good should be produced and at what rate and who gets that good. Remember I said that the United States has some centrally planned economy uh, similarities? For instance, the education system. 
in the United States. We decide how much money as a federal government to give to each state and then they decide how to divvy it out and what the requirements are for that particular state to get the money. In Texas, you have to meet standardized testing and the requirements in order to continually get that money. Most of you are probably very familiar with standardized testing processes. Although it appears that markets come about naturally, there are some inventions that have made them work better. Contracts, they are the times when you get something in writing or an agreement between two strangers and what they do is they are verification that you made a particular agreement when trading. If I buy something from you the more expensive it is the more likely I'm going to get a contract. When I was hired on at South Plains College I got a contract for my service. In exchange I was guaranteed I would get paid so much as long as I teach so much. This ensures both South Plains College and myself have a contract and have the ability to have an agreement between each other. I can't go to South Plains College and say, well, I thought you were going to pay me three or four times as much. They have it in writing. South Plains College can't come, can't come to me and say, Mr. Kemper, I thought you were going to teach three or four times as many classes. Secondly, insurance. This reduces the risk entrepreneurs face. The more insurance you have, the less risk. I personally have two vehicles. I have a Ford Taurus 2003 with 140,000 miles, very beat up. I also have a 2008 GMC Canyon. It's loaded with a nice sound system. A really nice toolbox which I just bought four-door and as of currently a really nice car seat in the back my Canyon my GMC Canyon my truck my baby has full coverage insurance on it in other words there's very little risk on it that's because it's very expensive to replace meanwhile I just have liability insurance on my Taurus this is because there's not that much risk if I get in a wreck. So, oh well. <clears throat> Thirdly, patents. This enables us to produce our good and encourages us to produce goods and products and services without being afraid of people copying us. That way we can profit from our own inventions. Before patents, people would copy all the time and therefore no one would want to in invent. Patents essentially give more incentive or encouragement to innovation. Third, or I mean fourth, is accounting rules. Accounting rules are very important. Accounting rules provide potential investors reliable information about particular firms. A long time ago well only 10 years ago but it, to most of you a long time ago Enron kind of messed with accounting and what they did was market to market accounting essentially they claimed all of the revenue that they were going to get next month in the current month so let's just say the current month is or August the next month would be September and we know that we're going to sell a lot of things in September so we go ahead and show in August all of the profit from September. Meanwhile, why don't we just go ahead and push all of our expenses in August to September? Well, what that does is gives us essentially a lot of revenue, a very inflated profit margin, and it looks like we're making a lot of money. However, when the stuff hits the fan and we're unable to no longer push back all of the accounting, the market market, market to market accounting, we essentially have to occur all of the costs without any of the revenue and the bottom falls apart. With specific accounting rules, 
investors have less risk when investing. Market failure and the role of government. Even in a perfect, perfect economy, there are sometimes market failures. A market failure is when the markets are unable to operate efficiently on their own. A few examples of this are pollution, public goods like roads, education. They're not very profitable. Think of the post office. Not very many companies are lining up to have a post office system, a postal system, in which they deliver to all kinds of little towns. FedEx will do it, but at a very high premium. In order for these little towns to get mail, we need a public good. Now, whether you agree or disagree with the post office system, the only way it can exist as it, it is, is with it being a public good. Imperfect information, that's essentially insider information. It's when I know more about a particular product or firm than you do. A good example of this is if I knew Enron was going to fall apart or fail and that they were participating in market to market accounting, which I just talked about, but I didn't tell you about it and I tried to sell you some of their stock for my own advantage, that would be market failure. Fourth is imperfect competition. This is when there's monopolies. If only one company or firm controls the market, they're able to set the price so high that we all have to take it. And essentially, we are unable to buy other goods or purchase as much. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I am operating on minimal sleep because of my newborn son, so if I stumbled a little bit, I apologize. If you ever have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email address is jkemper at southplainscollege.edu.